Hello guys, um, I'm going to try to get this presentation to work, but I can kind of go through this and you can kind of look at this at your own pace and review. So let's see if this works. All right, so I'm going to go through the first uh, PowerPoint, which is George Washington's presidency and his precedents. Uh, I also titled it the Federalist Era. So if you look here, we have the first election of the United States. Um, there was only 10 states in the first election. Three of them had not approved the Constitution yet. It's North Carolina, New York, and Rhode Island. Washington runs unopposed. No one challenges him. No one else wants to be president. John Adams runs um, just because the way it's decided at the time is whoever gets the second most votes gets the vice presidency. So John Adams gets the second most votes as vice president. So really, that's about it. Washington runs opposed. He wins unanimously. It's the first time in U.S. history that it happens. Uh, it's the only time in U.S. history so far that it's happened. So that's George Washington for you. Um, we have Hamilton's economic plan. Alexander Hamilton is a genius in so many ways. Uh, without Hamilton, we really don't get to exist as a country. He helps author the Constitution. And then when the new government forms, Hamilton is the one who George Washington picks to be in charge of the economic plan. He's handpicked by George Washington. Um, so Hamilton comes up with this plan, and it says right here, comes up with an ambitious plan to strengthen our country, make it stronger, and improve our financial reputation. Kind of like I worded it as improve our credit score. So, and that leads me to the next slide here. And his plan is basically this. The federal government, okay, the national, they will assume, okay, or take on millions of dollars of debt that the state governments owe. The state governments owe this debt because of the Revolutionary War. Okay, so the actual proposal is that the federal government will assume the debt of the Revolutionary War. This allows the United States to improve its credit because they have debt to pay back onto. They show other countries, hey, we can pay back this debt. We're capable. We're kind of like an adult country. We can pay our bills and other countries trust us more. So like if we're paying back our debt that we owe to France, Spain might look at us and be like, oh, look, they're paying back France's debt. We can trust them and loan them some money. Okay, so that's number that's reason number one, Hamilton does his plan. Reason number two is that since the states fought for the freedom of the nation, Hamilton argues the nation should pay the debt. Um, that's reason number two. Hamilton argues it's kind of the right thing to do. States fought to free the country, so the country should be the ones paying the debt. And the third reason ties in with that one, and it conveniently gives the federal government some leverage over the states. The federal government can kind of convince, maybe bribe or blackmail the states a little bit. Um, but also the states might just respect the federal government more. So that's his plan. Um, there is opposition, uh, especially in the South. The southern states don't really care much for this plan for two reasons. One, the southern states don't like a strong federal government. And if this happens, then it benefits the federal government and makes them stronger. Number two is that the southern states owe less debt than the northern states. Um, I've used the examples in class. If Bob owes $10 and Jim owes $100 and I say, I'll forgive both of your debts if you clean the entire classroom. Well, it benefits the guy who only owes Hundred who owes a hundred dollars much more than the guy who only owes ten. So the southern states are pretty upset. Well, Hamilton makes a deal with them. Specifically, he makes a deal with Jefferson and Madison, who are kind of the leaders for the southern group. And he says, "Hey, we'll move the capital from New York City in the north. We'll move it to a new place in the south. If the South supports my plan, so we'll move the capital from New York. I said New York City, which is New York." which is in the north. We'll move it to somewhere else in the south if the south supports the plan. Well, the south's like, yeah, you know what? That could be pretty good. So they carve out a new spot. We end up calling it Washington, D.C., Washington, the District of Columbia. Uh, and that's how we get our new capital location is this Hamilton's deal. Oops, wrong way. All right, well, that leads us to tariffs. Hamilton has to pay for his new plan somehow. He has the debt now. Now he has to have a way to pay it off. Okay, and the tariffs, tariffs are a protective fee or tax 
because it's designed to protect your country's business against other countries. So the example here is the US, okay? Let's assume these two have factories, one in the US, one in Britain, both have to make a dollar of profit. Okay, do you see that's profit one, profit one? Well, what if it costs more to make a hat in the US? So it's $5 to make a hat in the US, plus one profit, $6. $4 to produce in uh, Great Britain, $1 profit, that's five. So if it was just like that, if it was just those two things, then Britain's hats would sell better because it would only sell, it'd be $5. And let's assume they're same quality, right? So what America can do is charge a tariff. Okay, and that's these two points here. A tariff would hurt the British factory. Okay, so it would make the British hat cost $7 and the American hat would cost 6 So it would help keep jobs in America. And that $2 would go to the government and help fund new things. So it's kind of like a win-win. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So a tariff is a protective fear tax that's designed to help your businesses. It's like United States businesses function. Okay. So here's Hamilton. Uh, there's He's on the $10 bill. There's statues of him. I mean, he, he's a really cool guy. Like Alexander Hamilton is one of the most underrated founding pillars. He, without Hamilton, we probably don't even really have a country. Um, that leads to the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, I'm not going to play this video. We played it in class. Um, but the Whiskey Rebellion, okay, the other way Hamilton's going to pay for his economic plan is through taxes. And so Hamilton passes, it puts a tax on whiskey. Um, people in the western part of the country, like at this time, that's like western Pennsylvania, western Virginia, they get upset at this. They don't like this tax on whiskey. It harms like how they made money on the side by selling whiskey. And it's just kind of, in their opinion, like they thought it was a, an invasive tax. It kind of intruded on their lives. Well, the farmers get upset and they throw a revolution. Um, I guess it'd be more of a rebellion because it's not really a revolution. They throw their rebellion, they revolt. Well, <clears throat> If you think back to Shay's Rebellion, which was, oh gosh, it probably in December. <laughs> Shay's Rebellion showed that we need a new government. Shay's Rebellion was this rebellion of farmers, and it succeeded. It scared the states, and they form a new government. They create the new constitution. The Whiskey Rebellion here gets put down immediately. George Washington sends 13,000 troops to crush this rebellion. And so the key thing about the Whiskey Rebellion is... It shows that the new government, the new federal government under the Constitution, is not messing around. We're not going to be like, oh, we're scared. Like, let's, you know, cancel that tax. We're, the, the government's not going to get pushed around. You can't throw a little hissy fit anytime you don't get your way. And that's basically what the Whis Whiskey Rebellion shows. Okay, we'll trip out west. <clears throat> Britain and Spain still have forts and settlers out west. Okay, they're not supposed to. That's American territory, and it takes America off. <clears throat> and when America tries to do something about it, it irritates Britain and Spain, and they actually start arming Native Americans, which is not good. So as American settlers move out west, they encounter these armed Native Americans, and they clash. Washington tries to make peace with them, but Americans ignore the peace treaties and just move on to more Native American land. So fighting breaks out, and Washington's forced to send in troops. There's a pretty key battle called the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And it's where uh, Chief Little Turtle clashes with uh, U.S. troops. I think the general's name is Anthony Wayne. I can't remember offhand. Um, they clash. Chief Little Turtle is forced to retreat, so the Native Americans lose the Battle of Fallen Timbers. And that leads to what's called the Treaty of Greenville. The Treaty of Greenville forces Native tribes to, to give up pretty much all of what we, we'd call Ohio today. Um, the Native Americans had owned it. They signed this treaty, and... The settlers force them to go. Oh, I just got a notification that I can only go for 25 more seconds. So I guess I'm going to stop here. Um, then I'm going to record a new video and I'll put it up there. So I can only do two minute videos. Is what it is. Okay. Um, so Trouble Out West is where I'm ending here. Um, so I'll probably post another video that is uh, the rest of this slide. So uh, I'll see you then.